Well, over the years of ministry, I've been involved with a number of men and women who said, I'm a Christian. And they did seem to have some love for Christ. But frankly, when you look at their lives, their lives were too much like the world. There was too much sin and too much spiritual immorality and worldliness and, and indifference. And often the question asks itself, are they saved or are they not saved? Now, what makes this such a hard question and one that we don't even want to answer is that we look in our own lives and go, but I've got my own struggles with sin. And sometimes it's a besetting sin. Here's what I'm going to say. Ultimately, the fate of each and every one of us is in the hands of Almighty God. On the day of judgment, he makes the call, not us, and for that I'm incredibly thankful. However, the scripture is also very clear and it's united beginning to end in its message that if you search your heart and if you realize or wonder I'm spiritually lukewarm, where do I stand with God, what do you have to do? The scriptures say this, you repent and you make your calling and election sure. It is true repentance that is the mark of true salvation. However, as we've already seen in the book of Hosea, what complicates this is that there is such a thing as false repentance. The half-hearted, sorry, not really sorry. The okay, what's the least I have to do? What can I get away with and still get into heaven? Now, if you read the Old Testament, one of the great ministries of the prophets is dealing with this very issue. Repeatedly, they come and they speak to a nation, a nation who say, oh, we are God's people. We have repented. But when you look at the way they live, they live in worldliness. And the consistent message of the prophets to the nation and the people in the nation is repent. Now, Hosea is not at all reluctant to join this chorus. I know today, even preaching on sin and repentance, it's not a popular thing. But it's all right. Hosea does it, so we're going to do it. Hosea says to this nation, repent by the power of the Spirit and change your ways. Put off the old man, put on the new man. So this morning we come to the final picture from Hosea, and it's the power of true repentance. This is a great picture. We've already seen in this, that this book gives us a number of pictures, and I just want to put this in context for you. In chapters 1 to 3, we had that great parable, and it described a holy God and sinful man. We saw sinful men and women are all gomers, spiritual adulterers, before a holy God portrayed as a betrayed husband. And when you put it all together, you get the worst news possible. Every single one of us is a gomer without hope before this holy God. In our own strength, we're lost. But then we've seen the surprising thread that comes throughout this book. And I've called this thread a gracious saviour. You see it in these hints. There's a king in the line of David. There's a holy one who will come among us. You get these hints. And we are told that this one will come and take these gomers and wash them and make them clean. And they will become pure brides forever. So there's one who will come and make the unfaithful ones faithful. And it's this gracious saviour that gives us the main theme of this book, that God's grace is greater than our sin. God's grace is absolutely greater than our sin. And yet the question remains, well, who gets the benefit of this grace, this salvation, this washing by this gracious saviour? Hosea is in lockstep with the rest of the Bible as he declares, salvation flows from true repentance. Salvation flows from true repentance. Now, let me be clear. Repentance is not a work. It is a fruit. It is a fruit of genuine faith. So it's no surprise that Hosea the prophet ends his message with a call to repent. He's given us the gospel, and now what he's doing is he's issuing a call for a response. Now, before we look at this call from Hosea, I need to talk a little bit about repentance. You may or may not know, it is such a controversial issue in the church. I always get questions on it. 
So I'm going to give it my best shot. Here's my best effort at a definition. Couldn't keep it short, sorry. Repentance flows from true faith. Faith that God's holy, that we are sinful, that Christ is our only hope. It is a heartfelt conviction of our sin before God and a commitment to turn from our sin and strive in the power of the Spirit to live God-honoring lives as his faithful servants. Yeah, big mouthful, I know. Let me unpack it. In the Old Testament, there are a number of words for repentance and all of them basically have to do with turning. Turning from idols, from the world, from sin and to God. In the New Testament, the main word for repentance derives from a word that originally meant to change our mind, to realize we are wrong about God, wrong about ourselves, our only hope, and that we need to turn to God. As well, I want to tell you this. Old Testament, New Testament doesn't matter. True repentance is always linked with faith. True repentance is said to flow from faith. In a sense, you could say they're two sides of the same coin. When you come to faith that God is holy and we are not and our only hope is Christ, the only acceptable response to that faith is repentance. When Jesus began his ministry, what did he say? Mark 1.15, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near, what? Repent and believe, have faith in the good news. On the day of Pentecost... The Jews hear this amazing sermon from Peter and they go, what what do we have to do? And here's what he said. He said, repent and be baptized, each of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Repentance and faith are linked. As well, I want to be clear about this. Repentance in Scripture is never a mere intellectual exercise. Oh, I just have to change my mind. I don't have to change my life. Never. Never. You go to the seven letters in Revelation. He's writing to churches and there are these multiple calls to repent. To the church in Ephesus, God said this, Revelation 2, 4 and 5. I have this against you. You've abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I'll come to you. I will remove the lampstand from its place unless you repent. The Bible's very clear. You know true repentance by its fruit. Luke 3.8, Jesus said, Therefore produce fruit consistent with repentance. Acts 26.20, Paul says the same thing. I preach to those in Damascus first and to those in Jerusalem and in all the region of Judea and to the Gentiles. What did he preach? That they should repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. You can't escape the fact that in Scripture, biblical repentance, true repentance, leads to a change in life. There is fruit of repentance. Now, again, let me be clear. I am not saying that if you are truly repentant, you are sinless. I wish. In this life, no. No one turns from sin to never sin again. That's coming. You've got to die first. But in this life, what it does mean is you hate your sin. You strive against your sin. And when you fall, you are cut to the heart and you repent again. Now, the Bible's clear. Without this kind of repentance and the kind that bears fruit, there is no salvation. Now, notice I called this true repentance. And I do that because Scripture in many places speaks of a false repentance. Uh, Perhaps the clearest example is 2 Corinthians 7.10. Paul says, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, but worldly grief produces death. So there's two kinds of repentance. One that flows from this godly grief, and it leads to salvation. And there's a false one that flows from a worldly grief. That's the, hey, I regret that you found out about my sin, not... I have sinned before a holy God against thee and thee alone have I sinned. Now, this is what we've seen in Hosea. We have seen back in chapter 6 that the nation said, but hang on a minute, we're repentant. And Hosea said, "Eh -eh, false repentance. Back in chapter 6, we saw their repentance had no confession of sin. They didn't admit to specific sins they committed. There was also no genuine remorse. 
Hosea said, your repentance is like the early morning mist. Soon as the sun comes up, it is gone. And your repentance had no turning from wickedness. You said, we're sorry, and you kept right on worshipping your idols in your spiritual immorality. It's not genuine. So what we're going to see this morning is that he's saying what Israel needs is true repentance. Now, ultimately, we understand why that is, because true repentance is what unites us with the cross's power of forgiveness. It's true repentance that unites us with the cross's power of forgiveness. These threads in Hosea, we have seen, they lead straight to Christ, straight to the cross. And it's true faith that leads to true repentance that unites us with this power. Now, to pull all these threads together, why don't you turn with me to Hosea 11, verse 12. Hosea 11, verse 12. I'm going to start off with the need for true repentance. Again, this is one of these ones, you look at this and you go, whoever divided this book up? Uh, this verse belongs with what follows, but anyway, look at it, Hosea 11:12. 12. Now, when you read through Hosea, remember the nations of Israel and Judah were repeatedly saying, we are God's people. We love the Lord. We have repented. <clears throat> they would say things like, yeah, look, we're not perfect, but who is? We did sin. Yeah, who doesn't? But we said sorry. Back in Hosea 6, we saw this. They claimed repentance. But here is the reality. Israel surrounds the Lord with lies and deceit. And I think a better translation of the second part of that verse is, Judah wanders with deities, even though claiming to be faithful to the Holy One. Judah's saying, we belong to the Holy One to you, but they're actually wandering with every God. They're spiritually adulterous. Chapter 12, verse 1. Ephraim is so unstable, he says, oh, I trust God, but then he makes a covenant with Assyria, he makes a covenant with Egypt. And then comes the example of Judah in verses 2 to 5. Now, remember throughout this book, often Israel, the northern kingdom, was referenced by one name, Ephraim, one of the tribes. Here, Judah, the southern kingdom, is referenced by focusing on one of the patriarchs, Jacob. Why? Well, in the womb, Jacob grasps his brother's heel and tries to supplant him. He, he wants to be first. He grows up and he becomes a deceiver who will say and do whatever it takes to get what it is he wants. Now, there comes a time as an adult where he wrestles with God and he says, I will do whatever it takes to gain your favour. I will not let you go unless you bless me. There comes a time as an adult where he's at Bethel and he has that dream of the ladder and the angels and he makes this promise, Genesis 28. Jacob made a vow. If God will be with me, watch over me during the journey I'm making. If he provides me with food to eat, clothing to wear, and if I return safely to my father's family, then the Lord will be my God. He's claiming allegiance to the God of armies. I'm repentant. I'm your man. However, his actions say otherwise. Jacob is a man who says and does whatever it will take to get whatever he wants. So even after Bethel, even after wrestling with God, his life didn't change. Straight after wrestling with God, remember the next thing that happens? He meets Esau, his brother who forgives him, and Jacob lies to his face. The very next thing he promises, I'm going to take my family back to Bethel. They're on the way, and he sees Shechem, this very worldly place, and goes, oh, that's a nice place. And he leads his family there. His daughter's raped and his sons massacre the city. He then has this, all these episodes of favoritism among his children and he splits his family to the point that his sons plot to kill Joseph and sell him into slavery. Jacob then mopes and does nothing for decades and he shifts his favoritism to Benjamin. And there's a point where the other sons come and say, hey, we've got to save Simeon. He goes, no, nah. the only son I really care about is Benjamin. You can't have him. Jacob's a patriarch. Fortunately for us, the Bible doesn't whitewash his life. What you see is this weak man driven by his passions and you realise his repentance is hollow. Oh, he speaks a good game. I won't let you go unless you bless me. 
The Lord will be my God. I am repentant. And it's all lip service. The sin, the deceiving, the manipulation, the selfishness, it continues right on. Now, here's Hosea's point. Like patriarch, like nation. Both Israel and Judah talked a good game. We are the people of God. We've repented of our sin. And Hosea says, really? Where is the fruit of that? I look and all I see are idols and packs with nation and greed and immorality. Your repentance is false. And you have resisted prophet after prophet who has come and said, repent. And God says, enough. I'm going to act. Look, there is a huge lesson for us. Make sure your life matches your confession. Don't just talk it, walk it. Like many of you have probably been listening to the podcast, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, deals with some of the issues around the leadership in that church. And I'm listening to that thinking, wow, that could be me. Maybe it is me. Uh, Those traps are so easy for any of us to fall into. I was thinking of some of the lessons I took from it. Be aware of how easily sin can deceive us as to what's actually happening in our hearts. We all need people around us who are going to call us out on our sin and we all need to have the humility that when they do, we go, yeah, I need to repent. See, brothers and sisters, just because you got baptised, just because you became a member of the church, doesn't mean you put your cue in the rack and go, hey, I'm done, I'm good till glory. No, you never stop being vigilant about what's going on in your heart and your life. Otherwise, you end up like the frog in the kettle. And these little things become big things and you never realise how much you've compromised. And if you've got faithful friends, they'll call you on it. And you need to listen. You shouldn't be like the one that says, really, you're calling me out? What about the log in your eye? Who do you think you are? You need to say thank you. So Hosea is calling Israel out And you know what? Israel didn't like it, not one bit. But God's not done. So Hosea now describes the disciplining for true repentance. What do I mean by this? God actually loves Israel enough, and in fact God loves us enough, that he will discipline us to make us realise we need to repent. Proverbs 3.12 says this, The Lord disciplines. Who does the Lord discipline? Those he hates? No, that's not what it says. The Lord disciplines the one he loves. Hmm. Meditate on that. Discipline teaches wisdom. Because Israel will not repent, God says, I love you enough, I'm not letting you just sail off into oblivion. I'm going to discipline you. I'm going to do something that is actually an act of love so that some of you may repent. You see, you have to know you're under judgment before you'll repent. C.S. Lewis put it this way. Christianity tells people to repent and promises them forgiveness. It therefore has nothing, as far as I know, to say to people who don't know that they have anything to repent of and who do not feel they need any forgiveness. So that's Israel. And God says, I'm going to make you realise you need to repent. Verse 6. But you must return to your God. Maintain love and justice and always put your hope in God. Israel, you've got to repent. That's your only hope. Repent here is the Hebrew word sub. It's the common word for repentance. It means to return or to turn. You turn from your sin. You turn from the world and you turn to God. Notice those two parts. You return or you turn to God and you turn from idols, adultery and sin. And when you do that, you maintain love and justice. You live your life with your fellow men and women with integrity. You love your neighbour. You you stop sinning. Israel, he says, the fruit of repentance would be to stop trusting idols, nations, wealth, swords, and start trusting God. True repentance is known by its fruit. But Israel's fruit is bad. Look at verse 7. The nation allows dishonest merchants to prosper. Verse 8, the nation trusts its wealth, not God. 
They haven't turned from their sin. They haven't turned to God. And yet, despite these so obvious failings, Israel's like, us? We're not really sinners. Look at it. There is no iniquity in me. Nothing here to see. Nothing worth punishing. It's spiritual blindness and God will not overlook it. Verses 9 to 11. Here's what's going on. Just as God made the nation live in the wilderness, he's saying, you're going to face exile again. You're going to be driven from this land. Now, the Lord had warned them in prophet after prophet, and they said, no, God will never do it. They kept on sacrificing bulls and yet feasting on sin, and God says, I'm going to reduce those altars to rubble. Verses 12 to 14. Just as Jacob spent time in exile in Aram, so the nation spent time in exile in Egypt. But in grace, God sent a prophet, Moses, led the nation out of exile, tended the nation. He gave them his law. Israel's glory was, we are the people of God and we have the law of God. Now, how did the nation respond to this? By provoking God to bitter anger. They made a golden calf. They grumbled, spiritual adultery. And God says, I have no choice. I'm a holy God. I must punish blood, guilt, and contempt. You will return to exile. Chapter 13, verse 1. Let me give you some context to these verses. Israel was once nothing. They're a bunch of slaves in Egypt. And God chose to love them. He called them out. He gives them a land. He gives them a king. God makes them great. Under King David, they never lost a battle. Under King Solomon, they became the envy of the nations. Ephraim became great, and when he spoke, the nations trembled. God made this group of nothings into the envy of the world, and then they threw it all away. We love the Baals. They incurred the wrath of their God who gave them everything to the point that they have to be destroyed. You know, this is like the man with the amazing family and wife and there's years of love and trust and he throws it all away for a fling with the shiny young thing in the office. And they compound the sin. Instead of repenting, look at verses 2 and 3. They kept sinning. They kept making idols. They kept encouraging the people to worship these idols and kiss these calves. These are fools who just don't learn. And God says, I will not tolerate this. I'll destroy you. You will vanish like the morning dew that disappears when the sun rises. You'll be like the chaff or the smoke that disappears when the wind blows. Now, here's what you need to understand to get these verses. God is saying, this is not just an act of judgment from wrath. This is also because of love. God says, I love you enough that I want you to wake up and repent. Now, why do they have to repent? Because there's no other path to salvation. Look at verse 4. It's a key verse. I have been the Lord your God ever since the land of Egypt. You know no God but me, and no Savior exists beside me. It's not like there's multiple ways to God or to salvation. He's saying... Baal cannot save you. Assyria cannot save you. There is no saviour apart from the Lord. There's one way to eternal life. It is not through Buddha. It is not through Muhammad. It is not through science. There is no other saviour. One way. One way. See, they cannot deal with their sin. And the only way is the Holy One who comes among us. One way. What I want you to notice as this section continues, see, they're looking to these gods saying, these gods will give us this good stuff in life. They'll give us wealth and health and prosperity and all this kind of thing. And God says, you fools, I'm actually the only one that could give you that, Baal can't. And he says, you're even more foolish than that. You're asking for the wrong things. You should be asking for salvation from sin and death. And I really am the only one who can do that. See, so often we misunderstand this. We think of God sometimes, even as Christians, like the the magic genie in the sky. 
If I pray the right words and say the right things, he will give me. He owes me. Oh, Lord, please give me the gorgeous wife, the job with Google, the Riverside Mansion. In Jesus' name, amen. Said my magic words, now you owe me. Oh, wow. No. See, God is to be worshipped. We accept his plan for our life, knowing it's for our good. And God is more concerned with your soul than your marital or social status. And if what you actually need is not the things you're asking for, but some suffering and trial, if that's what you need more than lattes and ocean views, God actually loves you enough that that's what he's going to give you. Why? Because often giving us the desire of our hearts is the worst thing that can happen to us spiritually. And this is what happened with Israel. Look at verses 5 and 6. So here's Israel in the wilderness. They've come out of Egypt. And they're in the wilderness. They're in the desert. It's horrible. There's no land. There's no crops. And they're like, oh, send us back to Egypt. It was much better there. And then in Numbers 13, the 12 spies go into the promised land. And they come back and say, hey, it's all great. You should see the place we're going. It is amazing. It is filled with pomegranates. It's filled with figs. Hey, we brought some grapes back. Two guys to carry one bunch of grapes. And everybody's getting really excited until they say, oh, there are also giants. Then it's like the, the balloons popped, and then there's sin, and then there's 40 years of wandering. But anyway, finally they do make it to the promised land, and it is great, land of milk and honey. And what happens? It's not like they're in the land and every day going, thank you, God, we love you, we're living in faithful obedience. If only. They get in the land, they get self-satisfied, they get proud. They're like, we got everything. we got the land, we've got a king, we're the envy of the nations. Who needs God? Not us. Look at it. Therefore they forgot me. They forgot him. They've got a king and wealth and prosperity. Who needs God? Oh, that we needed you when we're the hungry rabble in the desert, but now we've got everything, we don't need you. You know, that is so often us, isn't it? So often, you know, it's like we try every door, we can't find the help we need, so we pray, oh God, you're the only one. I need a godly husband, I need a cure from cancer, I need safety amid national strife, whatever it is. And sometimes God does grant that desire and you know what happens? We say, thank you, God, and never think of it again. We forget him. See, so often, and it's one of the problems when you live in a place like Australia, if you've got health, a good job, and a great family, we don't need God. It's one of the things that makes evangelism so hard. And so because he loves us, God says, I'm going to bless you with trials. Hallelujah. Instability trials, maybe some persecution, bit of judgment. I'm going to shake you from your complacency and remind you what you actually need is me. You don't take your next breath unless I say so. Look at verses 7 to 13. God gave them everything. He gives them a land and king and priest, prophets, the law. He gives them prosperity and blessing, and they forget him. Hallelujah. We've got our kings, we've got our idols, we've got our allies in the nation. Remember I told you at the time Hosea wrote this, that northern kingdom, spiritually t an absolute mess, but very prosperous. The wealth is flowing in. They're expanding their borders. Militarily, they're doing great. Who needs God when you got all that? And God says, I gave it to you. I can take it away. I will take it away. He says, I'm going to be like a lion. I'm going to be like a leopard. I'm going to be like a bear. I'm going to rip you open and take everything. I'm going to take your king. So you realize there's only one true king. It's me. You haven't been wise. I'm going to send judgment. Give you a little wisdom. But here's the thing. It's not because I hate you. It's because I love you. I want you to know you have no help but me. Have you ever stopped to consider the words right at the beginning of James? James 1-2. Consider it a great joy 
my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials. He doesn't say, feel this joy when you're suffering. No, no, no. None of us, well, hopefully none of you feel joy at that. He says, consider it joy. Know it's a joy. Why? Because of what it's doing. It is weaning you from the world and self-sufficiency and making you know your only hope in life and death is Christ, Christ alone. When trials come, here's what happens. Something bad's going on, and people come knocking on my door going, crying, <laughs> what's God doing? It's terrible. How can he do this to me? God's got it wrong. You, you can pray, tell him he's wrong. What they don't like is when I say, hmm, God must really love you. What? Well, he disciplines those he loves. They don't like that. That's not what they want to hear. But James says, consider this discipline a blessing because it reminds you that our hope is not in this world. Your hope is not meant to be in your health or your family or your job or your superannuation or the fact that we live in a great nation. Your hope is in Christ alone. So why is persecution, trial, a blessing? Because then you might realise that actually the same God can give us what we really need. And what we really need isn't wealth and political stability. We need salvation from sin and death. Look at verse 14. This is a great verse. I will ransom them from the power of Sheol, the grave. I will redeem them from death. Death, where are your barbs? Sheol, where is your sting? You've heard it before. Just about every funeral you've been to, you've heard it. But usually they read it from Paul, who's quoting Hosea. In 1 Corinthians 15, he quotes. But Hosea's point is the same. He's saying, hey, Israel, hey, Grace Bible Church, what is the profit if you got all these things you wanted and lost your soul. What you really need is ransom from the power of Sheol, redemption from death. See, God's plan was never like, oh, well, they've sinned, I'm going to give them a great life, and then there's death and judgment. No, no, the plan was always, I'm going to create a way that they will be ransomed from the power of Sheol and redeemed from death. Israel's so short-sighted. God's saying, this is what I want to do for you. And they're saying, hmm, we'd rather have the prosperity and peace, thank you. And God's saying, you don't even know what's good for you. So I'm going to send some judgment. I'm going to make you realize what real wisdom is. And they're still saying, no, no, we just want the bumper crop, thank you. And God says, no, nah, you're getting wisdom true judgment. You know, sometimes God gives us wisdom by saying, if that's what you really want, you can have it. It sort of did that by putting them in the land and giving them a king. We want a king, we want a king, until they got a king and it's like, we don't really want him. Growing up, both of my parents were really heavy smokers and they looked like they were enjoying it a lot. When I was around six or so, I'm looking at this thinking, they're getting such enjoyment out of this, it must be good, and I wanted to smoke too. And my parents said, no, you're not. And so I did what every terrible six-year-old did. I threw the mother of all tantrums until finally my mother said to my father, just give him a cigarette. If that's what he wants, give it to him. One large inhalation later, I thought I was dead. <laughs> to this day, it is etched on my psyche. You know, sometimes you teach them a lesson by giving them what they ask for and you realise, I really don't want this. That was a bit of Israel's lesson. More often, Israel's lesson had to be, hmm, I'm sending some judgement, I'm sending some disciplining to make you realise what you need is me and what you need is forgiveness from sin. I'm going to do whatever it takes because I love you. It's so the end of verse 14. Compassion is hidden from my eyes. It's like, I'm just going to cover my eyes and send judgment. Verse 15, judgment's coming. It's going to be a wind. It's going to remove all this prosperity I have granted to you. All that milk and honey, it's becoming desert. 
that promised land, taken it from you. Kings, gone. Riches, gone. Verse 16, Samaria will bear her guilt because she's rebelled against her God. They'll fall by the sword. Their children will be dashed to pieces. Their pregnant women ripped open. God's discipline, God's judgment, it is not just a function of his wrath, but also his love. When you read the post-exilic prophets, so these are the prophets writing after Israel's been taken out of the land, goes in exile in Babylon and comes back. Some of that remnant did repent. If you see them in the new heavens and sit down and say, tell me about it, I suspect they'll say something, you know what? What's in our nation torn apart? Losing our king, our land, our temple, watching our children dash to pieces, that's beyond horrible. But that's what it took. We were so blind, that's what it took to wean us from our sin and our self-sufficiency to show us there is no saviour but God and only he can ransom from the power of Sheol. So that judgment was, in fact, a mercy. Years ago, many years ago now, I spoke with a man who told me his story. He said, I I had been a professing Christian, but the reality is I was involved in every form of sin and just relying on grace to cover my failures. Then the day came, he said, I'm up on my roof, and I fell, and I became a paraplegic. He said, at first, I hated God. All I wanted was to die. But he said, over time, I realized, whoa, this is grace. This is mercy because that's what it took to wake me up from my spiritual stupor and lead me to repentance. He said, it's horrible, but he said, to this day I thank God for it because it saved my soul. That's what's supposed to happen for Israel. Brings us to our final chapter. It's a short chapter, it's really beautiful, and here we find this, the power of true repentance. It's a picture of what God will do for gomers who repent. It's balm for our souls. Verse 1. Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you've stumbled in your iniquity. It's a plea to return. It's the common Old Testament word for repent. And then if they repent, here's what happens. Verse 2 and 3. It's a model for true repentance. Now, you remember back in Hosea 6, I told you, back there it's false repentance. No confession of sin. No genuine remorse, no turning from wickedness. Here God says, well, have a true confession of sin. Verse 2, take words of repentance with you and return to the Lord. Confess your sin, name it. We worshipped idols, we committed immorality with the Baals, we did not trust you. Also have genuine remorse. Verse 3, say to him, forgive all our iniquity, accept what's good, so that we may repay you with praise from our lips. I like what J.I. Packer said. He said this, True repentance only begins when one passes out of what the Bible sees as self-deception and modern counsellors call denial into what the Bible calls conviction of sin. See, if your repentance is, I just don't want people to know how bad I am. I don't want my reputation sullied. Rather than, I have offended a holy God against thee and thee alone have I sinned. It's not genuine remorse. Thirdly, You need to have a turning from wickedness. Verse 3, Assyria won't save us. We will not ride on horse. We'll no longer proclaim our gods to the work of our hands. We're not going to keep on doing the same things. We won't go to the nations like Assyria. We won't trust horses to save us. We won't keep making little idols and bowing down and going, these are our gods. These will give us things. True repentance means you put these things to death. None of the sorry, not sorry, now back to my sin. And if your repentance is true, here's this incredible promise, verses 3 to 7. For the fatherless receives compassion in you. I will heal their apostasy. I will freely love them, for my anger will have turned from him. I'll be like the Judah Israel. He will blossom like the lily and take root like the cedars of Lebanon. His new branches will spread and his splendor will be like the olive tree, his fragrance like the forest of Lebanon. The people will return and live beneath his shade. They will grow grain and blossom like the vine. His renown will be like the wine of Lebanon. See, true repentance unites sinners with the power found in this one that we have seen, the Holy One among us, the King like David. And we know 
that ultimately that power flows from the cross. And because of the cross, he will heal our apostasy, our sin. For in him, the wrath of God falls at the cross and we receive the righteousness of Christ and our apostasy is healed. Now that is ultimate. We have that positionally. But today, what we have is the power to fight sin. What we have is the power to be progressively more like Christ. But we will never defeat sin in our lives in this life. But this is a promise. Hang in there. The day is coming. He'll heal our apostasy forever because he loves us freely. And knowing this should lead to great joy. These are pictures of joy. Um, David, Psalm 32. How joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How joyful is the person whom the Lord does not charge with iniquity and whose spirit is no deceit. When you confess your sin and you know you have this, There is joy. These are pictures of this joy. We have these images of refreshing dew and blossoms and fragrance, these metaphors of stability and protection, roots like cedars, branches spreading over us, living under his shade, pictures of abundance. He will give us these things, grain and fruit of the vine. So this crushing weight of I can't do it is replaced by he does it. And you receive joy. Verse 8. It's a promise of a time that will come. When by the power of God, Ephraim will be done with her idolatry. Not by her efforts, but by the working of God who produces the fruit of righteousness. See, here's the point of this book. Israel could never remove her sin. But on that day, God will and he'll do it fully. Craig Lloyd can never get rid of his sin. He still struggles, but I rejoice one day those struggles will be done forever. And finally, the book ends with this call for reflection and application, verse 9. Let whoever is wise understand these things, and whoever is insightful recognize them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. He says, you know what, if you're wise, you'll understand the message of Hosea. And if you reject it, You're a fool. The wise say, thank you for discipline. Thank you for grace. I can't do it. I repent and I trust. The rebellious says, I don't want that. I still want my stuff and I think I can do it. Now, perhaps they'll gain the world, perhaps they won't, but I'm telling you, they will stumble eternally. Perhaps there are some here this morning who have never repented. You've not bowed the knee to Christ. I want to say to you, the message of Hosea is this. It's never too late. No matter what you've done, if God can save Gomers, he can save you. The Bible is filled with stories of murderers, adulterers, deceivers who are saved. You're going to see them in heaven. Even Jacob, the deceiver, at the end of his life, he repents, he comes to faith. He's in Hebrews 11, this hall of faith, not because, hey, he had this sterling life filled with good works. Frankly, you're not going to find him. He's there because he repented and the blood of the cross availed for him. You don't earn salvation, but you can accept it as a gift. God's grace is greater than your sin. And brothers and sisters, there's a message here for us. You became Christians by faith and repentance But the Bible says for the rest of your days, you've got to be vigilant and hate your sin. And when you stumble, and you will, then you repent. We need to constantly confess our sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You make your election and your calling sure by striving with everything you have to live for Christ and honor him. It is true repentance that unites us with the cross's power of forgiveness. And when you do repent, then all these promises in Hosea are yours. And I love the way it's put in Hosea too. We're told that on that day, God's going to take you, Gomer's, and make you his wife forever. He'll take you to be his wife in righteousness, justice, love and compassion. He'll take you to be his wife in faithfulness and you will know the Lord. We understand how that happens. It's at the foot of the cross. 
that we gomers are washed and made clean and transformed in a faithful brides and united to God forever. And it is there that God's grace triumphs over our sin for all eternity. And if you understand that, then you understand the book of Hosea, and then I've done my job. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this book and the pictures of grace. Oh, Lord. We read about Israel and what we see is us. We read about Gomer and what we see is us. But then we see Christ, the Holy One among us, and we rejoice and we say amen. Father, help us to understand that by faith in him, by repenting of our sin, we can access the power of the cross and be washed clean. And these promises in chapter 14, these promises in chapter 2, that they will be ours forever. Help us to proclaim that gospel in Christ's name. Amen. What can wash away our sin? Only one thing. Let's stand and let's sing of it.
I want to close by reading the benediction from Jude. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen.